All right, so I'd asked you to read uh, a chapter in Matt Mason's um, book, uh, specifically the chapter where he talks about punk capitalism. And uh, I like to reference this, and I get it, it's week six, and you're learning remotely. The chances of you actually reading stuff right now are like so fucking low, like incredibly low. Um, so I'm just going to go over the chapter a little bit, pull some bits and pieces. Um, but Mason, you know, talks about the value of piracy, how innovation comes through piracy, and it always has. I mean, if we look at what Lessig has said and how we've learned about the industries that try to police content, music industry, radio industry, TV industry, cable industry, book industry, um, music industry, I probably already said that, film industry, um, all these industries are born, born out of piracy. And what that means is unauthorized uses that led to new, new innovations and new industries. And you need that um, in, so, in some ways. So he talks about punk. And he relates, he talks about what he calls punk capitalism. Um, and this isn't your normal type of, you know, capitalism that we're used to seeing and reading about uh, in, the, in the news. Um, this is a very different type of capitalism. This is a more subversive type of capitalism. So what do we know about punk culture? I imagine some of you know a little bit, okay? And Mason kind of goes through punk culture as what? It's about DIY. It's about do it yourself. It's about, you know, people inventing in bedrooms, people making music in basements. And it's about people tinkering with code, home alone, etc. It's about doing it yourself and, put, you know, not relying on companies, on not relying on funding from companies. It's about the rejection of authority. It's about undermining authority. Punk the punk subculture as it started in England was you know, a working class culture and it was, it was counter hegemonic. It was anti-establishment. It was anti-authority. Fuck them, you know, like F the system, you know, all, all that, all that stuff. So there's a little bit, um, you know, and what he tries to do though is relate, relate this to innovation um, in, in the world and tech industries and et cetera. He goes through multitudinous examples of that. Uh, punk is participatory. It's read-write. It's web 2.0. It's a dialogue. It's not a monologue. It's, you know, at a punk show back in the day, you know, there wasn't a great deal of separation between the band and the artists and the audience. The audience could get on stage. The band could get into the audience. There was a, a feedback loop, so to speak, and everybody was partaking. It wasn't just the artist creating the show, it was you being an audience member that, that partook versus like going to a rock concert or going to a concert where you watch Kanye West. And you don't really partake in the, perfor in the performance, like you're there, but you're not partaking in the, in the performance, okay? Uh, punk is about appropriation. It's about, you know, borrowing because you have to. It's about taking and attaching new meanings and doing new things with things that are, that are, that are old, um, you know, and challenging authority through that, um, you know, and it's not necessarily always this challenge of authority is not necessarily overt in the sense of like, yeah, let's go, let's go resist the system by appropriating things. No, but the appropriation and the re-articulation of meaning given to objects and how you use them, how hip hop DJs use turntables or samplers, how artists, you know, use Photoshop, you know, um, etc. Um, you know that that is like really important. And you may not have this idea that like, yeah, I'm I'm out rejecting authority and doing all this stuff, but you know, your act of manipulating and appropriating is rejecting authority. It is it is rejecting common notions of the singular author and singular genius and originality and creativity held in society. Punk is about subverting the mainstream, under you know, basically doing something subcultural, doing something that's that's new and that's unique and that's underground, that's hip, that's cool, not not what's popular. Rejecting what's popular. And punk is about empowerment of everyday people, not just the rich, not just the wealthy, not just the college educated, just not just the privileged. It's about, you know, everyday common people 
you know, feeling empowered, okay? And that's very important. So it's a two-way, you know, experience. But also, often what happened, you know, what, if you know, if you're familiar at all with the, the history of punk music, is that, you know, it started out as very subversive, very underground, very, you know, anti-establishment, and then it got sucked into the establishment. It became Blink-182 and Green Day, and it became whatever the hell is out now, um, AFI and freaking, I don't fucking know, you know, whatever. It's become Forever 21, where you, you know, it's like, it's become mainstream. It's like soccer moms can be, have punk style and little kids from the suburbs can be little punky style, but they're not like punks, you know? So punk got incorporated into the mainstream, um, you know? And that's a big thing that Mason also touches on is that you know, what was once very underground and subversive becomes, you know, kind of cartoonish and, um, and you know, consumable. Uh, how can you take something that's rough, rugged and raw and people are afraid of and make it consumable like a bag of chips, make it feel safe, right? How do you, commodif how do you commodify it? Matt Mason, you know, talks about numerous examples uh, in his text about this pirate radio, um, you know, pirating sneaker, all sorts of instances of it. But basically, he says that the pirate, you know, um, replaces inefficient systems. I think a great example of an inefficient system was the CD. Uh, the CD, you know, it was fairly cheap to make, but there was a great, you know, it was all made out of plastic. A lot of fossil fuels go into making that. Uh, it also, you know, a lot of fossil fuels go into distributing it, to going and picking it up, um, et cetera. Uh, and then waste, you know, the waste, the waste from it. And also storage and taxes that you pay for, um, retailers pay for uh, storing inventory. And along comes a more efficient system, the MP3, the iPod, okay? So it replaced this inefficient system, and it came from outside of the industry. Um, but Mason contends that, like, the pirate is like a bootlegger. He's thinking, like, the pirate mentality. The pirate's a bootlegger, um, you know, and a guardian of free speech, you know? Uh, oftentimes, you know, when you have established industries and established ways of doing things, there's gatekeepers. Pre-YouTube, pre-being able to edit video on your computer or on your phone and shoot video on your, on your phone, etc. there was a lot of gatekeepers to making movies, to getting your music heard, to making music, to recording music, booking studio time, all that stuff. You know, it's all kind of, that's all kind of gone and that allows for more people to have different forms of, of, exp of expression when things become more democratized. Um, Pirates force industries to become more efficient. I think that, you know, is really, really important. Um, and like the MP3 and iPod, the music industry fought and fought and battled it, sued its consumers, did everything it could, and then eventually, you know, had to adapt to streaming and is still trying to figure that out. Um, we benefit from pirates giving us access. I mean, it makes communication far more democratic. It gives us, you know, you want the Pirate Bay and Torrance. It just makes access to content, maybe even to content that wouldn't make it through certain gatekeepers uh, accessible. Um, piracy creates choice. So oftentimes we're given a, you know, um, a very small amount of food at the buffet and piracy adds another table with a whole bunch of dishes to that because when you think outside of the box when you adapt and adopt the punk capitalist mentality um, you know you you offer something something new you offer more choice uh, to to people and to consumers okay uh, and this with this piracy creates new markets often innovation highly innovative and disruptive technologies and innovations come from outside of the industry like again with this this the compact this the cd the music industry liked it. They were making a ton of money off of it. It was very easy. They knew how to do it. It worked, it worked really, really, really um, well for them, you know, but the pirate created a new market, all the new markets for 
uh, hardware and playback technology for streaming sites, etc. Okay, uh, by thinking like pirates, right? People grow niche audiences to a critical mass and change the mainstream from the bottom up. I think this is super important. Companies follow what we do. All of the shit that you see in the mainstream, in the media, all the cultural trends, all that, that stuff that becomes popular, that comes from us. And I think that's like vastly and incredibly important that that stuff comes from us. It gets then incorporated into the mainstream, you know, and commodified and sold on, on a mass on a mass level. But, you know, industries are always followers and we're the leaders. I don't remember that. 